Michael Stevens. Thank you for joining me for this session of Book Bites. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, my book, The Making of Pioneer Wisconsin, published by the Wisconsin Historical Society Press. And uh, what I've tried to do in this book is to share with you uh, excerpts from the experience of ordinary people that illustrate the kind of emotional side of the pioneer experience. We tend to think about the past as being a very different place. Uh, a novelist once said, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. That's very true. And yet in some ways they are very familiar. They look so different in the daguerreotypes where they had to become very stiff. And what I wanted to do today is introduce you to a few of the people who are in the book who I've actually enjoyed meeting them through their writings, and uh, I hope you do too. Take Christian Fecker. He was a German who settled in Mequon. He was a musician back in Germany and became a farmer here in America. And he was kind of the uh, Google of the 1840s or the Dear Abbey. Uh, he had all kinds of advice for people coming to Madison or Wisconsin. <laughs> Uh, some of them were common sense, know what you're talking about before you open your mouth or don't give too proud. Or he loved giving advice uh, so much that he wrote a book in German where people in Germany who wanted to come to Wisconsin suggested what ship to take across the Atlantic, what, uh, how, how to get to Wisconsin. But much like folks today, he really liked talking about the weather. Uh, when asked what Wisconsin weather was like, Ficker described it like this. He said, the summer heat is oppressive. The winter cold, pretty severe. The weather here is extraordinarily changeable and the fall is glorious and beautiful. Sounds a lot like today, especially that winter cold is pretty severe. And he wasn't the only one who liked to talk about the weather, just like we're common, uh, uh, fond, fond of that. Some folks even tried to put what we'd call spin in trying to convince folks out east to move to Wisconsin. There was a fellow in Mineral Point and he wanted to encourage people to move to Wisconsin. He was writing the last week of October 1839. And the problem is there were four inches of snow the previous week. So Here's how he tried to explain why Wisconsin was a better place to live than Southern Ohio or Indiana or Illinois. He said, our winters though are perhaps somewhat colder than the states to our South, but they're much more pleasant and healthy. They're uniform throughout, the air clear and bracing. We have none of their half cold, half warm, disagreeable slushy weather. We seldom hear complaints of coughs and colds. Uh, that's saying the glass is half full there. Well, what else do we like to talk about? Well, if you're like me, food is something in Wisconsin we're fond of uh, discussing. Same true with the pioneer generation of the 1840s and 50s. And for those coming from Europe, complaints about ocean food was the most frequent comment. Regardless of where you came from, you complained about the food much like we complain about airlines food on those rare occasions when we get it. Uh, Gerhard Kremers from Germany, he went to Manitowoc in 1848 and he wrote about his experience on board ship. He said, our food was very poor, poor coffee, poor pork and smelly beef. John Ramis from the Netherlands, moved to Milwaukee, 1854. Potatoes became worse each day. Drinking water became brackish. And Matthias Durst from Switzerland came to New Glarus in 1845. The meat was hardly edible. Hard tack we have sufficient, but this is not human food. The pigs that are kept on ship refuse to eat it. Flour was gritty with sand. Potatoes very bad, black, bad smelling and rotten. Hardly fit for pigs. If you value your health, bring your own food on board. Oh, but once in America, the story was so different. The pioneer generation, the number one thing they wrote back home was the abundance of food, especially meat. 
George Frommeter, he was a Bavarian, 1846, came to Jefferson, and he wrote back at the sheer abundance. One letter he wrote in, here in America, one eats meat every day, sometimes twice. Morning and evenings, we have coffee. The Americans have meat on the table three times a day and many kinds of vegetables, which we don't know of in Germany. And then there was John Frederick Diedrichs. Uh, he wrote a humorous account back home. It emphasized some of the monotonous uh, nature of food, but again, the abundance of meat. He talked about the rhythm of life on his farm. And at midday, after working in the fields, in the morning, we return to the house and mother has white beans with bacon or bean soup with bacon or rice soup with bacon or barley soup with bacon or flour dumplings with bacon, which usually constitutes our Sunday meal. Then they'd go back out in the fields and in the evening, everyone came back home where they treated themselves with black coffee, dry bread, and sometimes bacon. One of the things I really enjoyed in putting this book together was finding samples of uh, folks who normally might not appear in histories. Sarah Foote, a teenager, really missed her classmates when they moved from Ohio to Winnebago County. And they came on land by wagon and she kept a diary of the wagon trip. For her, it was a real adventure. For adults, the trip was not so much an adventure. Charles Minton Baker came west from Vermont on both uh, land transport and on ship. And he noted that the crying and scolding and snoring and groaning was a scene which he did not wish to experience again. Well, what else do we like to talk about? Well, young men today think about young women and young women think about young men. And in 1840 in Wisconsin, there were eight men for every five women. So John Hodgson came from Yorkshire, England and settled in rural Iowa County. And what did he write home about? Girls are very scarce here. They are all bachelors around us. Tell them I could be very much at home if I could have a missus about. A man is free here and there are several rich widows, but I'm the poorest man in the territory. The experience of women too um, varied and they too had their minds on young men. There's Veronica Curler who married a Milwaukee merchant after a whirlwind three week engagement. And she has the giddiness of the newlywed as she talked about the wedding and uh, her experiences as a young bride, getting up early, cooking for her husband. But the flip side was the loneliness and separation from family. One woman in a rural area wrote, you cannot imagine how very lonely I feel. I think my favorite person in the entire book though was a woman named Rachel Line Wood Bass, who seems to express the full gamut of emotions, uh, all of which she seemed to wear on her sleeve. She was 28 years old. She was a school teacher and she settled in Platteville, a single woman. In words that uh, were written shortly after the semester ended and words that many a school teacher might say today, she writes, you cannot imagine my joy, which I experienced the succeeding day. This is the next day after school's ended, the semester's ended. I felt as though my shackles were off, as though I was free as a bird. I was not required to be in school the next day, the next week or month. And then she goes on to say, but nonetheless, I missed the students. She saw them uh, a few days later out playing and she said, yeah, they're, they're pretty cute and I miss them. Um, adapting to new languages and what to do about old customs, often things we talk about too. 25 year old uh, John Curler left Bavaria in 1848 and told friends about coming to America. And he says the main point to consider is language. English is spoken in court, trading, and in general, you'll find it all over North America. And it's a little hard at first. Milwaukee is the only place in which I found that Americans concern themselves with learning German. 
and where the German language and German ways are bold enough to take a foothold. You'll find inns and beer cellars and billiards and bowling alleys, as well as German beer here. What would Wisconsin be without that German beer? But at the same time, those immigrant pioneers who came from Europe worried about their children losing their ability to speak the old language, a common story. One Norwegian traveler noted how quickly Norwegian farm girls learned English. He said, their English is quite correct. But as soon as they start speaking their mother town and tongue, it sounds broad and clumsy. One thing we often forget about pioneers, and I think this is because of the photography we have from that time, is their sense of humor. In the early 1850s, one of the issues that divided Wisconsinites was about the manufacture, sale, and distribution of alcohol. Uh, some Wisconsinites wanted to pass a law that would effectively create prohibition in Wisconsin, and uh, others, especially foreign-born citizens and Germans, uh, thought this was an awful thing. So. When word came of these plans, a group of men uh, formed a fictitious Lake Muskego fishing club and wrote a tongue in cheek petition full of mock seriousness that rivals anything you'd find in The Onion or on Colbert. And they began worrying that the prohibition of beer, wine and liquor would quote, multiply the watering drinking classes of creation to such an awful extent and they went on and talked about a series of catastrophic events that would happen as a result, each worse than the other. First of all, without beer or wine to drink, people would drink water and that would drain Lake Muskego and it would kill the fish. This was unbiblical in their words because there was a responsibility to care for all creation. Secondly, fishing was guaranteed by Magna Carta and it denied people their pursuit of happiness. Fish tasted better when cooked in beer. Draining the water from the lake would put an end to manufacturing. No more water power, no more industry, no more jobs. No water in the river system would mean no more lucrative offices to clean the rivers, might lead to a raising of taxes. And so they concluded instead of banning the sale of beer and wine and alcohol, they suggested Wisconsin pass a law against watering down good liquor. Fortunately for them, they got their way, at least till prohibition in the 1920s. And just like today, pioneers have varied experiences. They had high hopes we should be happy and John Diedrichs, the man with all the bacon, uh, wrote another letter back home and talked about how he has a farm of 80 acres. And while his livestock was small, small, it consisted of a dog and a cat. You ask, is it really good to be in America? Aren't you sorry that you've gone there? And he answered, yes, it really is good here. He talked about how it would be hard for him, but his children he expected would have a better life. And others, thought coming to Wisconsin was the worst decision of their lives. John Bjord Allen in 1844 was living in Milwaukee. He was very disappointed. He says, I do not advise any of my relatives to come to America. Do not think of coming to America at all. And still others realized it was a trade-off. One of them wrote, you have freedom, you have income, you have the sky and the earth but you also have a strange language, many low class and rough country people and little of the enjoyment that could so easily be provided. But one gets accustomed to everything by and by. And once the nut is cracked, the kernel tastes better in the end. That generation, the 1840s and 50, were very aware of their part of the creation of a new place. And they like to talk also about what makes up the Wisconsin character. And one of my favorites was a man in Racine who identified four characteristics. I think they still may resonate. He thought people in Wisconsin were marked by freedom and independence of mind. 
They didn't like others to tell them what to think. He said you could count on hard work. That was built into the Wisconsin character. There was a public spirit. There was support for roads and schools and churches. And finally, there is a more friendly neighborly feeling prevailing. All take an interest in the welfare of each and of all together. I think that last statement, a more friendly neighborly feeling prevailing sticks with me. And I think there's an element of that too that's carried down from that pioneer gen generation today. We don't always live up to that aspiration, but I think they agree that neither did they. But it's interesting to know that these folks from so long ago share a lot with us. Well, I hope you enjoyed this chat. If you're interested in learning more, I invite you to uh, take a look at my copy, The Making of Pioneer Wisconsin. Thanks so much. And uh, like the pioneers, stay warm. Beware of that cool weather. So long. Mm -hmm.